our first presentation. We have folks from Gunakusha Family Assault Support Services, Ms. Barnes and Alex Martin, and they're going to be joined by Eddie Thomas, who is going to be singing a friendship song, and he's from the Onondaga Eel Clan. And I do want to take the time to introduce Ms. Barnes. She's the anti-human trafficking and community educator mentor worker at the We Are All Traveling Together program for Gunakusha Family Assault Support Services. She is from the Mohawk territory of Akwesasne, but recently moved to Six Nations and is Turtle Clan. When she isn't raising awareness about human trafficking, she can be seen with her family in the sports arena doing beadwork and being outside doing high tannings. And she's passionate about using traditional teachings and language in her work and being able to pass on her knowledge to the youth of Six Nations. And Alex Martin is Mohawk Nation Wolf Clan from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. Alex finds pride in working for his community and is in currently employed at Gunakushra as the anti-human trafficking youth counselor and provides therapeutic counseling and traditional teachings to clients aged 12 to 29 that have been impacted by human trafficking. Alex also enjoys spending time with his family and friends, playing sports and traveling the world and learning about new cultures along the way. So I want to thank these two for joining us this morning and welcome you to our event here. Hello everyone, my name is Galena Vegas Barnes. I am Turtle Clan and Yama for having us speak. That was quite an introduction. I'm glad that we're rolling out the red carpet for us here, it feels like. I hope everybody has uh, take something from this presentation today. Uh, we're going to be covering some heavy topics, but excited to deliver today. My name is Alex Martin, is, and you guys got have already got a background of me. All right, so for today's purpose of our presentation is we want to be able to provide human trafficking and sexual exploitation education. So some of the things we're going to be talking about is our history of human trafficking and how it pertains to um, our Indigenous history, our Indigenous timeline. Um, we're going to dive right into what human trafficking is, and we're also going to talk a little bit about what our program is what the one year, um, does for the community of Six Nations. So in March 6 of 2021, the government of Ontario announced that they're going to be launching a new anti-human trafficking um, and child sexual exploitation strategy to kind of combat them. We were funded through the Ministry of Children, Community and Social for over the course of about a span of five years. So from that, our program the one name, which is Cayuga, meaning we are all traveling together, came about. We are located at Ganokosha Family Assault Support Services, and we're located at 26 Sunrise Court in Oshwigan. Our program started um, in April of 2021, and we are funded to service youth between the ages of 12 and 29. We have three youth counselors, Alex Martin being one of them, and we are also, I am the community educator and also youth mentor. So because we're still pretty new, we're still trying to get our feet on the ground. We're trying to network with other organizations. We're researching and we're trying to gather statistics, especially for the Six Nations area at this time. But in the meantime, we just want to really make sure we're spreading as much awareness as we can on human trafficking and educate sure. what human we always trafficking start our day with prayer. look like in Indigenous communities. Telling, uh, we also offer supports for any youth, any youth who are at risk of being trafficked. Our, our presentation can be pretty heavy at times. We're going to dive into some pretty heavy topics. So I just want to make sure everybody stays grounded. And we will be doing some grounding breaks throughout the presentation just to keep everybody present and in the moment. But please reach out to any supports if you need it. So I just want to start really quickly with doing just a little sociometry. So if everybody can open up their chat box, answer the two questions. You can answer them both in one, in one little chat. How much knowledge do you have about human trafficking? And how comfortable do you feel with working with a person who has experienced trafficking? And rate yourself on a scale of zero to 10. Zero meaning um, like no zero knowledge and 10 being very knowledgeable. We just kind of want to see where everybody is at this moment. I hope today that everybody gains some new information, some new knowledge about human trafficking. And like I said, we're going to be doing a lot of heavy topics today. So I just wanted to share a grounding technique that you can do throughout the presentation if you feel like you're being triggered 
or you feel like it's getting really heavy for you, um, that's making sure you're taking really good deep breaths. So making sure your feet are flat on the ground. You can put your right hand over your heart. You can close your eyes if you need to. And making sure you're taking some really deep breaths into your nose and out through your mouth. So we're going to start off with a little video. I can't live at home anymore. Why? What's going on? Mom is just so sad since Grandma died, and David's just drinking all the time. Wait, David? That white guy from the casino? Yeah, yeah he moved in. He was nice at first, but now he's drinking in the morning, and, and he's not nice at all. That's sad. Your boyfriend, Phil, just needed that shot. You know, he's not my boyfriend. You wish. Hey, no, Summer, hey. You know you're pretty enough to get any guy out there, right? No, it's not that. It's... You know... My mom's... Wait, is David messing with you? I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> them two over there. Looks like they fit in pretty good. Nah, too easy to get busted. See that native chick right there? She's hot, she's young, and she's safe. Clowns will go for a brown skin beauty from the res, from the looks of it. She'd be easy to turn out. What do you mean she's safe? It's all about jurisdiction, man. Basically, they came up with these laws that we can do whatever we want to these native girls on the res. The feds can't do anything about it. The other day, I seen them arguing with the tribal cops about something that happened a foot over into the res. Feds that couldn't prosecute. The tribal cops they don't have money to do anything to us. It's like the wild, wild west. We be the cowboys. <laughs> Didn't know that, man. Yeah. Hey, what's up, man? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, how young? Mm. All right. Yeah, let's meet at the concourse downtown. Reservation. I just told you that. Uh, actually, let's make that the. Uh, Blue Cactus Hotel. No, no, it's just a better place. Hmm? Okay, yeah, I'll text you the room. Look, man, it's completely safe. All they can do is put us off their land. They can't even touch us. And the feds, shit, they want an airtight case, and we both know these girls ain't gonna say shit. You in or you out? I'm in. Money. Money all day. David told me he fixed this car. Great, I'm, not, I'm gonna miss the ceremony. I really think you need to talk to your mom. About the car? No, about David messing with you. I can't fix this. Party's gonna rock. Right, girls? Right, girls? Start acting like it. Hey, I think I know them. <laughs> Gotta be kidding me. Problems with the car, huh? Yeah. Can you fix it? <laughs> I don't know about that. I think I know y'all two from the gym last week, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> you're that guy who asked Summer on a date. <laughs> Should've taken me up on it. I've had a good time. What's that? Oh, uh, it goes with my regalia. Oh, pretty. Girl's a very pretty girl. 
<laughs> We've got to be at the tribal ceremony in about an hour. It's like y'all need a ride, huh? How about I drop y'all off at home and see about that date? I don't know. Oh, come on. I mean, what are you going to do? You just going to sit out here all day? Just going to drop them off real quick and then, you know, we'll see about that date, okay? Hey, girls, come here. Did you know each other? Yeah, um, we're going to a party. Yeah, free food, drinks, should be fun. But they can't go, they're actually got to go to a tribal ceremony. We need a ride home now though. Oh, well somewhere we're literally going right by your house, like it'd be no problem to take you. It's no big deal, Summer. Completely fine, I promise, Summer. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'll close this up. You grab your stuff. We'll keep going, okay? So I like watching that video because in the video they use some language and some topics that we're going to be discussing throughout the presentation. And I will now hand it over to Alex who will be doing the history. Yeah, so we'll be looking back at some history now before I really get into what is human trafficking um, and circling it back as to how it's really been happening since um, contact. Up there you have a definition of colonization. That's just to remind you to keep in mind of the next couple slides that are gonna be coming forward. We know that sexual violence and religious introduction and forced assimilation were deeply tied to European colonization. As we're going along, I just wanna make note that I'm going to be using some language along the lines of indigenous and first nations. I'll also be using Haudenosaunee and Ongohawe. And for our the Six Nations and my language I just basically represents the first people. So sexual assault rates and violence against Native American women did not just drop from the sky. They are a process of history. Human trafficking and sexual violence did not just does not just happen to women and girls. We know that it's also happening to boys, men, and two-spirited people as well. This has been systematically happening since contact. If we think back to early contact and colonization, human trafficking was already taking place. Our earliest known instance of human trafficking was Pocahontas. Pocahontas wasn't necessarily the Disney princess that we all are aware of. John Smith had actually gone and, and forcefully removed Pocahontas from her family to gain access to resources, interpretation, lands, basically to take over what we have already in place, um, exploiting her for those needs. So looking at the timeline and history, we're going to look at some key times human trafficking was taking place. So beginning with the European contact. So pre-contact, this is the time of the Shoni people. We lived by the great law of peace. And it was in peace and harmony in which all of our people had lived. We were grateful for our creator and all of creation. We wore our traditional clothes, spoke our traditional languages and carried on our traditional ceremonies and practices to be passed on to generations and generations through our children and youth. The governments was of Turo Wampum at this time, and that for those who know and who those who don't, Turo Wampum is actually a wampum belt that has two purple stripes going through with three uh, white stripes, and those are to, the purple stripes are to recognize two vessels, one being on the Ongo Homeway, which are traveling in a birch bark canoe, and the other was the settlers traveling in their ship. The meaning of that is that we are to be on our own path and stay on our own path, and never to cross sides. And that is what we had um, lived by and uh, supported each other with was the uh, Turo Wampum. Our council was made up of chiefs and clan mothers with the direction of chiefs coming from our clan mothers. Um, this is what we call our matrilineal system. All of our women were held in a high regard and had the most power within our community and made the decisions for the community. So now we'll talk about the fur trade. Uh, relationships began to change in the early 1800s at this time with European settlers and missionaries. 
It was common for European settlers to marry Ngohoe women to gain access to the knowledge of the land and for the women to act as translators, as in such like the Pocahontas story that we know. In our culture, we had strong sense of balance in our relationship between men and women. We chose a life partner when we were to walk side by side through life and neither was above one another. And holding a balance in regarding our relationship. The settlers thought that the man in the household should hold all the power. And this is when things began to change. We looked at Indigenous women with objects of temporary and sexual gratification. If anybody has heard of the term a buck, meaning one dollar, at this time during a fur trade, you could trade one dollar for one buckskin. So that's where the, that term comes from. And during the fur trade, uh, early fur trade days, you could receive two Indigenous women for one buck, buckskin. So if we're looking at it, Indigenous women were regarded as less than one dollar, basically, at this time. Then we go into 1869 grad for gradual enfranchisement of Indians. This is when the matrilineal system started to take over. Women were degraded and controlled. So at this time, women marrying into another tribe or band would then lose her status from her tribe and move into that tribe, as well as her children. Women marrying non-native would lose status for herself and her children. But if a man were to marry into indigenous tribe, then he would gain status at this time. So even in the picture shown, indigenous women were starting to be seen as more exotic creatures and, and objects for sexual use at this point. And if we think back to how we used to live in the Great Law of Peace and how our council ran in the Longhouse, it was the clan mothers who would elect the chief. And that was a lifelong duty. You made a commitment to the people forever. And then things started to change with this as well. And that's when the elected council started to come in. The chiefs were elected by male members and were to serve a term of no more than three years at this point. So if we look back, this is the creation of the residential schools. Right now, it's a very tough topic throughout Canada. We're not going to spend a lot of time on residential schools, but we did want to make note of it. Due to the fact that there was human trafficking going on within residential school system. At the mush hole here by Six Nations in Bradford, we know that there was labor trafficking going on. So the boys would be forced to work all long hours a day for no, no money, hardly any food, any breaks, do all the farming for the surrounding communities. The females were to do all dirty laundry and cooking and cleaning for the wealthy with surrounding communities. So those are just some of the labor trafficking that was taking place here at the residential school in Bradford, as well as the sexual exploitation that had been going on there as well. And now we look at the 60s school. So residential schools began to be phased out in the 1950s and 60s. In the 1960s, we start seeing Indigenous children being taken from their families, communities, and often without their consent. Predominantly non-Indigenous families throughout the whole world, across Canada, United States, everything. The con province considered this the easiest way to dealing with the Indigenous population within the child welfare system. Uh, at this time, you could purchase an Indigenous youth to child for $10. They were labeled in newspapers. Provincial child welfare agencies chose to remove children from their homes rather than provide community resources and supports at this time. This led to institutionalization of Indigenous children and physical and sexual abuse at the hands of these children's protectors. This in turn led to the Millennial Scoop. So in Ontario, between 1999 and 2005, there was a 124% increase of the number of Indigenous children in care. This increase in child apprehension rates has become known as a millennial scoop. That's just a brief little history on how we can see human trafficking starting throughout the history and where it began. It is very, very heavy topic see, with all the things going on right now. So I just want to take a break. I want you guys to take a pause. We're going to do a little grounding here. Gnukushra. We're big on grounding, keeping everybody supported and offering support for anybody who needs it. I just ask that right now, everybody can close their eyes, put their hand on their heart, feet flat on the floor, 
And we're just going to take some deep breaths just to get rid of all the negative energy that we just talked about. So if we just close our eyes, in through our nose and out through our mouth. And as Dylan and Douglas said before, that's just something that we can do throughout the process if we ever feel ourselves becoming overwhelmed with anything. And it's something that we can do throughout our life as well, day-to-day -day life. So here we have the legal definition of what human trafficking is, and that's every person who recruits, transports, transfers, receives, holds, conceals, or harbors a person, or exercises control, direction, or influence over the movements of a person for the purpose of exploiting them or facilitating their exploitation is guilty of an indictable offense. I really wanted to add this in because it also plays into how a trafficker can be charged of human trafficking. They have to have the three parts. They have to have the recruiting, transports, transfers, conceals, holds with the exercise of control or influence or movements of a person for their purpose of exploiting. They have to have all three parts to charge someone of human trafficking. And sometimes that's not always the easiest thing to do. Sometimes the victim may not even know that they are being trafficked or they can't really get enough evidence to prove all three things. Um, so I just wanted to add that in there. So in indigenous communities like here in Six Nations, human trafficking may look like offering a person a place to stay. This is what we refer to as couch surfing, offering a person transportation to a medical appointment or getting the person groceries all in exchange for sexual services also exchanging drugs or food for sexual services, as well as sexual exploitation. There's also forced labor, slavery, servitude, and organ removal that all fall under the category of human trafficking. So I just want to touch really quickly on what consent is. I think when talking about human trafficking, it's really important to talk about what consent is and what kind of the laws are for Canada. So in school, we learn fries. So it's freely given. You know, you make the choice without pressure, manipulation, or under the influence of drugs or alcohol. It's reversible, meaning that you can change your mind at any given time. Informed, you can only consent to something that you have all the information of. Enthusiastic, when it comes to sex, you should only do stuff that you want to do and you feel comfortable doing, not something you feel obligated to do. And specific, so you're only saying yes to specific things. In Canada, a person must be at least 16 years old to legally agree to sexual activity. And any sexual activity without consent is a criminal offense regardless of age. So a person cannot consent to sexual activity if their sexual partner is in position of trust or authority towards them. The young person is dependent on their sexual partner or if the relationship between the young person and their sexual partner is exploitative. When determining whether the relationship is exploitative or not, a few factors kind of fall in there. So it would also be uh, the age different between the young person and their partner and how the relationship developed, and whether the partner may have controlled or influenced um, that young person. Just for time purposes, I won't go too deep into the trap, but I do want to mention it because I think it is a great tool for anybody who wants to check it out. If you Google, it is on the Ontario government website under human trafficking and their tools, or you can do a quick Google search of Ontario human trafficking tools, the trap. It's free. Um, you do need to sign up, but it's meant for youth ages 11 and above. And what it is, is a simulation activity that kind of takes you through how human trafficking can look, the luring and the grooming phase that we'll be talking about after this slide. It basically is pretending to text someone. So when you pull it up, you can kind of choose what you're looking for and either a relationship or a friendship or even just looking for, you know, popularity or, you know, friends, that sort of thing. And it kind of shows you how that luring and grooming processing can happen. I actually had my little sister try it. She is a teenager and I just wanted to see how it would go for her. So I remember showing her it and, you know, it was, oh, I'm not going to fall for it. I don't know how, how I could fall for it. You know, I'm too smart for it. But at the end, she ended up getting to the point where she was asked 
to do sexual things. She was at the point of being sexually exploited. And in the beginning, it just seemed as a friendship. So she didn't really know how it got to that point. So it's a really great tool for you to try out and do even for yourself just to kind of use it and see what are some of the language and some of the tools that they use to learn and groom through texting. So this is a timeline of kind of how human trafficking, sex trafficking happen. So the timeline can vary in duration. It can happen within a few days or it can take months. I know for myself, when before I first started this position, I thought human trafficking was someone seeing someone on the side of the road or abducting them, kidnapping them, and then forcing them into sex trafficking. But now with everything being online and with social media, it happens a little bit more slowly. Those cases still do happen, but a lot of the times is finding youth online through social media and through the internet. So it starts in the learning phase. So establishing a connection in person or online with the intent of developing a relationship for the purpose of exploitation. So the trafficker can be a stranger. It can be someone that the victim knows. It can be someone, you know, friend of a friend or friend of a family, it can be someone in school, or it can be someone that they met online. So during this stage, they start to get to know about the victim. They start to say nice things to them. You know, they start to give them that attention, start hanging out with them and spending money on them. You know, especially for youth who may be coming from a financially stable home or wanting to be more financial freedom for themselves, they show them how, you know, the finer things of life. And then it kind of leads into the grooming phase where the sex trafficker may act like a generous boyfriend or a friend. We'll get into the different kinds of traffickers or pimps later on, but they can be male or female. So this is where they use the term love bombing, where they shower them with gifts and love and affection. During these two stages, the trafficker will get to know every single thing about the victim, problems at home, problems in school, any dreams that they have for themselves, problem with friends, how the family dynamic works and how any vulnerabilities that the victim may have. They get to know the victim inside and out in these stages. When they start to build this really strong, concrete relationship, this is when they begin to start to isolate them and create that distance between their family and their friends. They really try and make the, the victim feel like they're the only ones that care about them. You know, they get to know all their details about their life and use that against the victim to isolate them from their friends and their loved ones. So then in the manipulation stage, at some point, the sex trafficker will ask them to do sexual things with them in exchange for all that the trafficker has done for the victim. You know, sometimes it can be posing for nude photos or having sex with the trafficker and they can videotape it, you know, with or without the victim's consent. It can also be doing sexual things with other people to pay back the money that the trafficker has spent on the victim or possibly to maintain this Instagram fancy lifestyle that they're saving up for their future together and that sort of thing. And the sex trafficker really manipulates them into thinking that this is the only way they can either be together or help the trafficker. This is the only way they can do that. So the trafficker may also start to threaten the victim, you know, saying, saying that they're going to expose the things that they've done in order to humiliate them, you know, by posting the photos or videos of them online. Um, they may also try to threaten the victim and hurting them or even someone they care about. You know, like I said, they get to know everything. So, you know, they could also say, oh, I know you have a little sister. I will get her into this too. That's just an example of how they threaten them, how they manipulate them into being sexually exploited, which is the main goal of the sex trafficker is to exploit the victim by making them have sex with someone in exchange for things like money. The victim says no, they will go to the manipulation and physical punishments. Sometimes the trafficker will even get the victim hooked on drugs and use that against the victim, making them do certain things for their drug dependency. So when looking at 
the different types of traffickers. You know, like I said, they can be male or female. It can be starting a new friendship. It can be starting a new relationship. And they can be of any age. We've seen traffickers caught as young as 14. So we'll start with the Romeo pimp or also known as like the Prince Charming. These are the type of traffickers that, you know, use the love bombing. They shower with them with gifts, the sweet talk, the compliments, and build a really steady, strong foundation of being the boyfriend to manipulate and slowly get the victim into sex trafficking. There's also the gorilla pimp who uses more force and physical abuse to force their victims into forced sex work. They can typically be seen pursuing teens at, you know, a mall or a party or on social media. And the familia pimp is a victim who is being trafficked by a family member or a family friend, someone who is familiar to them. Excuse my language, but there is also um, what is known as the bottom bitch. It is a person who has been trafficked for an extended period of time. So in the eyes of the trafficker, the eyes of the pimp, they are their number one. They're the ones they trust the most. So they will then start to recruit other vulnerable people through friendships and getting them into being sexually exploited. This is a person that you can sometimes see entering shelters or group homes and doing a lot of recruiting also on social media too. So high recruitment areas. If we just kind of sit back and think about some high recruitment areas, um, if everybody wants to open up the chat and just really quickly, if you want to start typing in where you think some high recruitment areas are. Malls, schools, towns off the highway, yes. Waterfront high schools, clubs, friendship centers, yes. Community centers, man camps that, yes, man camps, yeah. Dating sites, Snapchat, social media platforms, on routes, Timmy's. And when we think about all of the high recruitment areas that everyone has put in the chat so far, these are all places that youth are. These are the places where youth, you know, like to hang out, you know, so the shelters, the group homes where youth are, malls is a big hangout spot, bus shelters, movie theaters, schools, also places with like free Wi-Fi. So when they get up six nations, we have the library and we have Tim Hortons that are on reserve where, you know, sometimes the youth will hang out for free Wi-Fi. In our community, we've heard about vehicles stopping alongside the road while kids were playing outside. And we've also heard about our community members being followed outside of grocery stores in our neighboring towns. We've also heard about our community members being followed around inside malls or having those uneasy feelings while being in the mall and also being approached while loading up their vehicle. So another place that is for really high recruitment is social media. You know, most of us have cell phones. Most of us use social media. Uh, I'm guilty of it. I use it a lot, you know, and then also to streaming games online. You know, the same goes for our youth. And with COVID and the internet being, you know, where the traffickers are finding the youth, you know, with during the pandemic, everything has seemed to go underground and trying to be unnoticed. So I just want to talk a little bit about internet safety and some things that you can teach, even maybe yourself, youth and your family, your own children, grandchildren. Um, I think it is very, very important to know what youth and even yourself, what you're posting online, just for that measure of safety that you're not putting out any personal information, you're not putting out any locations as to where you are that can make it more of an easier target for traffickers. So when we look at social media platforms like Instagram, even when the account is set to private, you know, you can still have random people message you. And the thing that we are noticing a lot more with youth is that they get lost in this sort of Instagram worthy lifestyle of getting a lot of people to follow them, getting a lot of likes on their pictures, getting a lot of comments and making sure you take those Instagram worthy pictures. I don't know if you've ever been with someone and you're out eating and they, you know, go to take a picture of their food or kind of show where you guys are eating and, you know, someone will make the joke, oh, the camera eats first or something, you know, 
that sort of thing, it's easy for you to get lost in that. You know, so I just want to also state too that there are ways that traffickers can reach out to youth who do have private settings on their Instagram profile. I'll use my sister as an example again. She did some modeling for an Indigenous designer and she just took a few photos and I remember talking to her about internet safety and she ended up making her profile private. But she was still getting random people messaging her saying, you know, oh, I know this other Indigenous designer that would love for you to shoot photos with them. Or I know a great photographer that would love to shoot photos with you. And a way you can kind of spot these red flag profiles is when you click on that profile, they're going to have a generic picture. You know, it's it's not going to be a specific selfie that someone took. It's going to be a very generic picture where you can't really make tell what their face looks like or what any distinguished characteristics that they have and then when you look at their followers and who they follow they're going to have a lot of numbers for who they follow but as for terms of people who follow them back the number is going to be very very low so those are ways you can kind of tell if it it can be a trafficking profile or um, something along those lines. Uh, Another thing that just came to light on Instagram is that youth will sometimes have a profile that they keep private and they will share more private photos on and they will have kind of this other profile that they keep public and it's a little bit more secretive and they just post some random pictures on those profiles. I'm still learning a little bit on what the reasoning behind that is. But it's what's something that has come to light to me when doing my research within the last few days. So also, too, talking about Facebook, just making sure your profile is set to private, making sure you know who your friends are on Facebook. If you have a friend on your list who said, oh, my account was hacked, I had to create a new one, make sure you're going into your friends list and deleting that hacked profile because you don't know what kind of hacker that could be and you don't want that person getting into any personal information about yourself or your family because you know on Facebook it's a great way to share photos of yourself share photos with your family and stay connected in that way but it is very important to make sure what you're posting you know the biggest kind of example I can give to is first day of school photos I know it's always going around on Facebook you know sharing not to do those kinds of photos where you're giving your the child's age the day um, the school and teacher they go to because that's really just essentially giving that personal information in the hands of someone that you do not want to have that information so Snapchat is another social media platform that a lot of youth are on, you know, it's seen as like this confidential way to send messages, to send pictures, you know, because it gets erased after. But on Snapchat, they do have a map kind of tab on there. And that's where people can see your exact location on there. So making sure any youth in your family or even yourself, making sure you're on ghost mode or disabling that location, um, however you can because it'll even show if you're traveling. I think it even shows what kind of music you're listening to. It'll show your exact location on where you are. You don't want anybody that you don't know on your friends list too, if you do have your snap location on, making sure you know who your friends are and who is on your profile. The other thing I wanna talk about is OnlyFans. OnlyFans is a subscription website. So basically what it is, is you pay money each month and you can subscribe to different subscriptions. And these subscriptions can range from, you know, following someone for fitness advice. It can be following someone for nutrition advice, that sort of thing. But the main thing that OnlyFans has become known for lately and has become under fire for is their pornographic profile subscriptions that they have on there, where essentially women who do have OnlyFans can post explicit and pornographic photos and videos of themselves, and they can charge a lot of money for those photos, and they are making a lot of money that way. Anytime I'm looking up information on OnlyFans, I always get these documents where they're saying, oh, I quit my job as a you know, so-and-so, 
and I just do OnlyFans now because I get so much more money out of it. So they claim that they have a really vigorous and hard way you can show that you're of age. But there's been a few reports and a few cases against them where it's underage teens that are making profiles and setting up accounts and sharing explicit photos and videos of themselves. You know, one case, just for an example, I'll share one case that I came about was a girl, she was 15 and she wanted to go on a trip with her friend, but her parents didn't have the money to. And she knew what OnlyFans was and she knew kind of what she can access on it. So she joined up and she shared her photos and her video. It was just explicit photos she had of herself. And she was able to raise the money to go away. But after that, people were essentially stealing her photo and posting it online and ended up, you know, going around her community. She had family members that was finding these photos of her. You know, she did not think of the repercussions of what could happen of having this kind of site for herself and putting those things out there just because she's seen it as a quick way to get money so that she can do what she wanted. So that's another thing just to kind of be aware from. Streaming games, you know, Roblox, Among Us, Minecraft, Fortnite, all things I never really knew of until my son um, introduced me to them because that's what all the kids are playing in school. But essentially these games, you know, yes, you can. Just making sure you're going on them and making sure that the privacy settings and not being able to add people they don't know, not being able to chat with everybody, only their friends they have on there because they can chat with other people. You just don't know if they could be talking to a trafficker or an online predator on these sites too. You know, when I talk about media and stuff, I'm also talking about platforms like, you know, Kijiji, Craigslist, Backpage, even some escort servicing websites, you know, you know, essentially pages where you can sell things like an old toaster you want to get rid of, you know, Traffickers are using these services to sell traffic victims and to exploit them. They use a lot of code words. They are even now using emojis that are code. And we'll get into that in a little bit, talking about what those code words and what some of those emojis mean, which make it really harder to trace. So those are just kind of some of the internet safety precautions that we can take just to make sure we're protecting ourselves and our youth. So this is some of the red flag language that I wanted to add on here. You know, we have uh, turning a trick, which is committing an act of sexual exploitation, a thoroughbred, or it can also be, like I said before, a bottom bitch, which is said to be the top girl in the eyes of the pimp. In the video, we heard them talk about a turnout. Um, it can also be said as a flip or, you know, someone who is forced into or newly sexually exploited. A John or a trick is an individual who pays or trades something for the value of sexual acts. A madame, like we said, traffickers or pimps can be a madame too, so it can be men or women. A lot lizard, a term for a person who is sexually exploited at truck stops. A daddy is a term a pimp or trafficker will sometimes require his victims to call him, but we're now seeing more of the term as it being boyfriend. Some other ones, you know, they can call themselves girlfriends or wives or sister wives or wifeys. And those are victims that are under control of a pimp or trafficker that they'll call each other. You know, so these are just some terms. This list is ever changing. You know, what we're learning now is that we do need to update this list into more accurate terms for what some of the new younger traffickers are using. I just want to do a little activity with everybody just to kind of show how human trafficking is shown in social media and media in general. You can take out a piece of paper if you want. If you don't, that's fine. But we're going to listen to a little bit of Doja Cat's song. Her song is called Bottom Bitch. And I do want to add a disclaimer. We don't own any rights to the song. Um, and there's also profanity and explicit language, you know, just to warn you, but I just want to show you the kind of music that is out there, okay? I actually came across this song. I was just driving around with my sister, you know, she put this song on and at first I thought it was real catchy, you know, we're driving down and I'm kind of going along and then all of a sudden it's like, 
wait, like this little light bulb went off and I'm like, she is talking about human trafficking in a glamorized way. You know, as she's talking about, she's like, you know, that's my dough. She bought a crib, she bought a car, she's wearing fancy de designer clothes, you know, kind of glamorizing, you know, being trafficked that, you know, you can make all this money and kind of create this really wealthy, fancy lifestyle. You know, and Doja Cat is a very popular artist. I just really wanted to do this little activity just to kind of demonstrate that they talk about human trafficking. You know, it's out there. And most of the time it is glamorized to target youth. So emojis being the new code word. These symbols are found all over the websites where pimps are known to traffic. Investigators say if pimps were to use like obvious words, such as young or gave an actual age online that the website that they're trying to traffic would flag them. Some pimps have even used words such as fresh or sweet, but because that, you know, police are now able to easily track these words and flag them and, you know, the language that are being used for HT we're kind of coming up to speed with, but now it's a whole new language of learning about these emojis that they're using as code words. I was given the task to kind of look up some of these emojis about two weeks ago, and it was a lot to take in because they are now exploiting victims, like their services on, you know, Instagram and kind of out in the open, but also underground. It's very coded, very trying to get it out there, but in a very mysterious and secretive way. Some of the emojis that are found that are just related to HT are a the cherry symbol. So it's the two cherries um, together and that means virgin. It can also be someone who is new in human trafficking or newly sexually exploited. The number of roses implies the price. An airplane means new in town or willing to travel. The crown, if you see a crown and, you know, say it's a, a young girl and she's kind of putting escort services out there and you see a crown, it actually indicates that you're not talking to the girl when requesting these services. You're talking to her pimp, you're talking to her trafficker. So the crown indicates that the girl or boy is under control of a trafficker or pimp. And the growing heart emoji lets the buyer know that the girl or boy is childlike and still has some growing to do. Like I said, this is just a little bit of the emoji language because, you know, there's emojis now for, you know, selling drugs online. Sadly, there's a lot of emojis that pertain to child pedophiles and how they talk in code online. So it was really hard for me to do a lot of this research just because of how advanced everything is and how it's really ever changing because, you know, I just got used to the red flag language and kind of picking that through social media and media, you know, listening to songs and movies, but now we now have emojis, which are a new language and new code word that we are learning. I want to talk about trafficking on the highway. As well as a high recruitment area in Ontario, the 400 series highway is considered to be the hub of human trafficking. 71% of human trafficking cases in Canada are in Ontario. So all of the red markers that we see on this map along main towns, main cities, they are also main commercial sex markets along the 400 series highway. So when we think about, you know, where my community is in Six Nations, it takes about four hours to get to Windsor, depending on if you have a heavy foot while you drive or not. Also, it takes about an hour and 30 minutes to get to Niagara Falls and to get across the border. When you think about it too, you know the trafficker has all of the victim's documentation. So, you know, it's a little bit easy for them to access going across the border as well. I am from Akwazasne, which is around the Cornwall area. And it takes us about, you know, six, five, six hours to get there. And it also takes about nine hours from Six Nations to get to Montreal. So when we think about it, you know, you can have someone across Ontario within one day. 
you know, seeing how easy and fast it is to travel along the highway. That's why it's such a big problem for human trafficking. It makes it really difficult for police to track down traffickers and, and to find them. Most of the times they blindfold the victim. So the victim doesn't even know where they're going or where they are or where they're traveling to. In the list, I think someone mentioned en route, you know, along the highway, there's, you know, the hotels, motels, en route, rest stops, all along the little cities that make it really easy to exploit a victim along the highway. So remembering the picture that I just had where all the main sex markets were, where the 400 series highway led to, this is a picture that shows some of the First Nations community that are along the 400 series highway. So when we think about Six Nations again, we, it takes us about 20 minutes to get on the highway. So let's do a grounding technique. That's really heavy for me to talk about. Let's all get grounded together. So we'll do the butterfly hug. So put your feet flat on the floor, cross your arms in front of you, in front of your chest, kind of giving yourself a hug and gently begin tapping each of your hand one at a time on your arm. And make sure you're taking nice deep breaths. When we feel stressed or overwhelmed, sometimes it's easy for us to only start using one side of our brain. So this butterfly hug offers bilateral stimulation, which helps make you know, your left side and your right side work together and helps calm you down. Okay, shake it out if you need to. Don't hold on to any of any of the negative. So with all that we know now, with all the information that was just presented, who is at risk of being trafficked? And let's look at more why Indigenous people and Indigenous youth are more at risk of being trafficked. You know, like I said before, traffickers really identify a person's vulnerabilities and really target those vulnerabilities to gain trust and to form, you know, a really strong bond. And since everybody has vulnerabilities, you know, essentially anyone can be at risk for being trafficked. However, there are some specific factors that can make a person more vulnerable. So Indigenous women and girls are overrepresented in domestic sex trafficking, and especially at higher risk due to the history of colonization, uh, discrimination against Indigenous people and Indigenous women, like we've talked about in our last few slides, and Indigenous children or youth are overrepresented in child welfare systems in Canada, which has also increased their risk. You know, just looking at human trafficking cases as a whole, most of the victims have been a part of child welfare systems. So the age of recruitment can be anywhere between 12 and 25, and we're seeing the average age of recruitment being around 13. People can be targeted from, you know, various social economic backgrounds, you know, wherever they are living, you know, but also two more risk factors that can make a person more vulnerable is, you know, having that young age, having the history of abuse or neglect, especially by family members, you know, isolated communities up north, also to looking at each community and what resources are out there for youth and for people, what resources are there? You know, is there a low employment rate? Is it harder for people to get employment? You know, looking at those kind of demographics as well. The vulnerability to influences in the media, exposure to violence as a child, either witnessing or experiencing it. You know, that need of belonging that isn't satisfied by family or friends or having that loss of identity or loss of culture, the lack of financial stability or having an unstable home if they are, you know, at an early age experimenting with drugs or alcohol and perhaps forming an addiction from it, you know, parent abandonment, any, you know, school problems, bullying, um, things of that matter can make a person more vulnerable to being trafficked. So what are some signs of grooming? What can you start to look for in an individual that you think may be experiencing human trafficking or sexual exploitation? You know, like we said, in the timeline of human trafficking, they begin to isolate them. So if, you know, withdrawing from friends or family, if they're starting to be secretive of their activities, 
if they have a new boyfriend or girlfriend, or, you know, we know it can just be a friend that they don't want to introduce to their family or friends. But I do want to make a note that there has been some survivors that I heard talk about that they actually did introduce their trafficker who was a boyfriend or their friend who was their trafficker to their family, you know, so they were around each other, but they can, you know, be really secretive of the relationship that they're having. A person is suddenly spending time with an older person or a new group of people that you are suspecting may not be, you know, too good for them sort of thing. You notice that they're getting in trouble a lot more hanging around with this group of people. You know, youth are often staying out more later or often spending a lot of time on their electronic devices. So, you know, like your, their cell phone, they can be hiding it from you. Also being more secretive about their daily routine or internet usage. Um, I also want to mention too that sometimes they will have two phones. So they can have their phone that they use, you know, for their family and friends, that sort of thing. But they can also have a secondary phone that's used for, you know, as a burner phone. Absence from school or decline in school performance. I also want to mention here too, like when I thought about what a trafficked person would be, would be someone who is taken from their home and not seen from for days or weeks at a time. But someone who is also being trafficked can still go to school. They can still, you know, live at home, but they're very secretive of these activities that they're doing away from school and away from home. So they still can still go to school, they can still live at home and still be trafficked. And you notice that they're not really allowed to speak for themselves or their activities, or that, you know, it seems like they're being controlled by someone seems fearful, anxious, depressed, submissive, tense, paranoid, seems fearful around police. Um, another thing that sometimes traffickers will do is also making the victim do their, you know, quote unquote, dirty work, meaning, you know, drug dealing, stealing, that sort of thing. So they can be fearful of police, and especially if they have a criminal record. Some other things like physical signs is the bruising, scratching, uh, cigarette burns, fractures, you know, a lot of kind of physical signs you see that they're not, they're secreted above, they may not want to tell you. Branding is another thing. So like tattoos, it can be a tracker's name or it can be a symbol. I remember listening to a survivor and she talked about that her tracker's name was Jordan. So he had the Air Jordan symbol tattooed all over her. And when she would get in trouble, she actually had, um, he had her put the Air Jordan symbol right near her eye so that everybody knew who she belonged to. Expensive jewelry, expensive clothing, you know, more sexualized clothing are things to look out for. So those are just some signs to look for during that grooming stage. Looking at some barriers to exiting, like I said, you know, like when we're looking at the Stockholm syndrome, like the person, the tracker really works hard on building that really strong relationship with the victim. And most of the time, the victim does not even know that they're being trafficked because of that strong relationship that the tracker really embedded into the victim. You know, some things also may be no place to go. We said too, you know, the tracker may get the victim hooked on drugs or drug dependence, fearful, unable to make decisions or feeling confused or overwhelmed, lack of resources and lack of knowing their rights as a survivor of human trafficking. So, you know, thinking of things of like where they're going to get money, where's a safe place for them to live, how are they going to get food and transportation, Lack of support from friends or family, like we said, you know, the isolation stage where they begin to cut the victim off from their support system and also not wanting to experience that stigma of people finding out what happened to them or knowing what they did. And also to hearing a few survivors talk, what brought them back into being trafficked was, you know, that loss of excitement or freedom, you know, from curfews, from parental guidelines, you know, having that connection or that attachment to the freedom, the financial independence that they had, and kind of that fancier lifestyle that they were able to have while being trafficked. You know, when we look at how many times will a person leave and come back, 
before they actually leave for good. We kind of have to take it on a case to case scenario, but also looking at it too as kind of a domestic violence situation where they can leave but still come back a few times. I'm not sure, maybe Alex can jump on really quick, how many times it usually takes before someone leaves trafficking for good. Yeah, I had read and I had talked to some survivors um, and been on some other presentations before, and they had said it's around 16 to 17 times for a human trafficking survivor to leave before they're fully out. As we know, domestic violence cases, it's around nine before they're out. So you're seeing a big difference in that as uh, maybe it's the Stockholm syndrome, maybe it's all these things combined that has taken them so many times to get out before they're finally out, before they're finally free. Thank you, Alex. So let's lighten it up. Let's talk about what our program offers. Um, so here at the Unguata Bonye, we offer you know, we have youth counselors, we have three youth counselors. So we offer one-to-one -one counseling sessions, therapeutic counseling. We offer them a safe place, safety planning, brief services. We're hoping, um, you know, COVID being, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do youth therapeutic groups, you know, with the community. And in the meantime, you know, still just a raising awareness, education for the community and different organizations. We offer presentations for different organizations in the area or organizations just that just want more information about human trafficking. I actually went to Starbucks last week and, you know, the girls asked me, oh, how's your day going? You know, they're making my coffee and it took a little while. So we we're kind of chit chatting and I told her what I do, what my position is. And you know, it ended up building that connection of, wow, you know, we see a lot of people that come to Starbucks every day. We don't know what the signs are. We don't really know what to look for. What are some red flags that we can see? You know, so we kind of built that bridge and that connection that, you know, we're working on getting cars that have our information on. If, you know, let's say they were to see someone who is showing some signs of human trafficking and that they can give them just as a resource when they're ready to exit, that they have that information. You know, we're working on building the resources needed to eliminate some of those barriers to exiting. We're making sure we offer a holistic approach using our traditional teachings for their mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. You know, and we're doing a lot of developing youth workshops that are open to all youth, you know, not just youth that may have experienced trafficking or youth who are at risk, wanting to open up to all youth and make it our goal to be able to do traditional workshops, teaching things like I did a moccasin making workshop last night, which went really awesome. It was really good. Sewing, beadworking, and also incorporating our traditional teachings along with human trafficking education, you know, teaching things like healthy relationships, respect, empowerment, self-care, filling in on all of those aspects of the medicine wheel, along with teaching them how to stay safe online, how does human trafficking look like to youth, how can someone start to, you know, in that learning stage, what does that look like for youth? During the grooming stage, what does that look like to youth and how to keep them safe? You know, making sure that we're filling in and giving youth those tools to have in their basket to carry with them in their life journey. Just making sure we're really working hard on breaking those barriers that see Indigenous youth and Indigenous people as at risk or more vulnerable populations. So when looking at the picture, I just wanted to share, we were able to do a high tanning workshop with youth. Sadly, due to COVID, we had to stop. So we were only able to do a little piece of the process. So here you see them, they are flushing a deer hide, giving a shout out to my partner who got us the deer hide for us, which was awesome. Thank you to him. High tanning really holds a special place in my heart. So it was really, really nice to see the youth take to it as much as they did. When we first began started, we talked about respect and we we're talking about how to show the animal respect, how to give respect, and how to, you know, work as a team on this hide. And they've never really done hide tanning before. It was always one of those things where they wanted to learn, but never really had someone to show them. 
you know, they also stated that they wanted to learn to hunt and do more of these traditional activities, but they didn't really know where to go to. I just showed them a little bit, but they grabbed the knives and they went with it. And it was so beautiful. And just to see them just kind of get connected in that way. You know, they were even, I was like, oh, do you guys want me to put songs on or social songs for you guys to sing? And, you know, one of them just said, I think I have a song I want to sing. And as he started singing, they all joined in with them while they were doing the fleshing. And it was just really awesome to see. So I'm hoping that we can offer more high tanning workshops in the future. I just have our fingers crossed that we can do more in-person stuff with our youth because it's really beneficial and I, the youth really, really enjoy it. This is our number that you can reach us on. This is our cell phone number as well. I also listed my email address, my work email address. You know, if you are looking for more information, if you're looking for presentations, or if you have questions, you still have lingering questions, you know, reach out to us. We will be there to answer your questions and to help you guys along with understanding human trafficking and, you know, bring in that awareness. This is the Human Trafficking Hotline, which is a great resource. They offer free legal advice, restraining order advice, and can kind of help the person kind of create this plan on how to exit safely and in the best way that they can. So we are at the end of our presentation. We are ending a little bit early. I just wanted to make sure I got everything in, but I do want to pass it over to Eddie Thomas at this time. He is the cultural resources at Ganakusha, so he can sing his song. But I just want to say yawa everybody for allowing us to present our information and what our program does. I hope everyone gained a little bit of a better knowledge of what human trafficking is and how we can work together on raising more awareness and education about it. So yawa again, thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you for having us. I really appreciate it, Tate, and everybody taking the time to listen to what we had to say. I'm not sure if Glenda Douglas has the link for our conference that we will be hosting soon, but we are planning a human trafficking conference as well, which will be a full day event. We can get that out as well. Again, thank you guys for listening to us. And now we have our coworker, Eddie, and he's going to provide us with some songs. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My Indian name is He Builds a New House. I'm from the Onondaga Nation, Large Eel Clan. I'm the lead cultural resource for Kanukwestra. I've been here for about four years. I'm going to go through and sing a couple songs for us. These songs that we have in our culture and in our ways, they're used for our mind, right? A lot of our, our teachings it resorts back to the mind. And so our songs are like grounding techniques, right? To help ground us, especially after um, hard situations or hard conversations and things that go on. Today, we've been talking about our mothers, right? So in our culture, in Haudenosaunee culture, when we refer back to the women, we refer back to them as our mothers. All the time, we refer to them as Dwanoha, Dwanoha, our mothers. And so I was always taught that this is the respect that we're always to have, always to have this respect for the women, because whether they're a baby or whether they're 100 years old, they're mothers. And so we're always to hold them in that light. What I'm going to do for us today is I'm going to sing a, a women's dance song to honor towards the mothers, the ones that are stuck where they are and the ones that lost their lives and the ones that are survivors of this trafficking stuff. And so I'm going to sing this women's dance song and give thanks towards all of them and just honor. And so with that being said, I'm going to sing Eskanye, Eskanye Gainase. I actually created this song. Sing it. Hey, hey, Yeah. <laughs> 
The other thing that I wanted to do today was we're all in partnership through Chiefs in Ontario, all the chiefs. The way I was taught, my grandma, she used to tell me, Scott gets on, go home. There's one original people. She says, we all come from the same place. She says, that's why. She said, there's clan system everywhere. No matter what nation of Ongohongwe you go to, there's a clan system. And even though we might not all believe in the same, have the same creation stories and have the same stories, a lot of them have the same gist of this creation story. And so she used to say, she was a very, very knowledgeable woman, my grandma. And she used to say that we were one people at one time, but we just spread out across the map. And that's how it came to be. With this next song that I'm going to sing, I'm going to sing what we call Friendship Dance. It's just to remind everyone that Scott gets on Guatney Gohan as one mind. We're going to move forward. And it's through this way that we can help save everything and stop what's going on in this human trafficking, make our community safe by working together. We're going to sing this Friendship Dance song. And again, these songs are to help this day, right? Because this is a lot of heavy information. So this is just a grounding technique as well. So friendship dance. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for um, taking part in this presentation today. And I, I hope to see you guys in the future in person. So, <laughs> so, <laughs>